morning. That was all kinds of fun for me. I did actually lose my cell phone at some point during the, the, the meal this morning. So if you happen to have found a black Samsung laying around, that, that's where it belongs, just in case you're wondering, you know. But good to be here. <laughs> it is good to um, see all of you. Um, and we're actually going to dive into our message today. Um, let's open with a word of prayer. Um, dear Father, we need you, and we are so thankful for who you are, for what you've done for us. Um, God, we are in need of your touch, of your hand, and Lord, we are so thankful that your, the death of your son Jesus and his death and resurrection is such a truth that we can cling on to, and even in a morning like this, that still makes all the difference in life and in death and with everything for us, Lord. Lord, help us to, to see you, to cling on to that truth um, this morning. Lord, you are so good in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, actually, really appreciated your sharing today, uh, Ken. And it was actually more or less what I was planning for my in introduction to my sermon, which is kind of a great thing, too. But in even summarizing everything that Ken was saying... Like what is that really all of about? If you put that all together, how do you find a word to encapsulate like that whole Christian message and what we're talking about in Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, and, and everything else that is kind of caught in that? And there's a few words that the Bible kind of uses in order to do this. One of them is gospel. Is good news, that there's a way that truth is the good news of all of these things put together is the sort of good news preached into our lives, brought to us, that we need to receive. Um, another is glory, that there's this sort of profound glory to the resurrection of Jesus that makes all of the difference. Something about Jesus' death and resurrection that sets it apart from everything else in life. <laughs> You know, like if that thing is true, if that is true, if Jesus' death and resurrection is true, and he is who he says he is, it changes absolutely everything. It has to, right? It has to, right? If, if it wasn't true, what would life actually be like, right? What would, what would we be left with? What would we have to cling on to? How do you live? What is saving you from yourself? How do you deal with your, your guilt and your shame and these things in your life? What do you actually do? But the scriptures say, no, there's, there's a real glory that all of those sorts of impressions that you have in your life, that there's more to living than what you see in your day-to-day -day life, Right? We have these sorts of instances. You, you, you live in relationship with people. You have this sense of the beauty of God's creation. And we are inherently, as people, spiritual beings. We have this sort of sense, no, there's actually more to what I'm seeing and what I'm feeling. There's something real here. There's something real about it that connects to a much greater truth. That things that are beautiful, that people that you love in your life, that those things bear to a truth that would be true whether you believed it or not. And the scriptures say that Jesus came and he lived and he died and he rose again as the ultimate declaration of what you're experiencing, what you're seeing there is true and it is fully revealed in Jesus and who he is. Right? Jesus died. And if that was the end of the story, none of us should be here today, <laughs> right? In fact, this church shouldn't be here. There's no reason for any of us to do many of the things that we do today or any other Sunday. And even in fact, I mean, Easter Sundays are often Sundays where um, we have more people who probably don't know the Lord. And if that's you, I'm glad you're here. But even for those of you who don't consider yourselves Christians, it is still very true that if this story about Jesus' death and resurrection was, was not a thing, did not get propagated, was not a thing, it would change who you are today as well, right? World history would be different. Canada would be different. If Jesus never walked the earth and said anything like do unto others as you would have them do unto you, the world would be a different place, actually. Right? And it affects all of us and, and where we are. But the scriptures say, and the essential sort of truth of the Christian faith is that Jesus' death was not the end. And so the Bible goes to pains 
to lengths to point out all of these descriptions from eyewitnesses who say, I saw Jesus. I saw him die. We know he was dead, but I saw him live afterwards. And that group of people who saw this truth, who saw this as a true thing, were intent, intent at this point in their lives of telling all those around them, of spreading that truth. It was something that was necessary and important for others to believe as well. And in fact, those early witnesses were willing to die for that truth. Right? They, they weren't making it up. <laughs> you can accuse them of being crazy. You can't accuse them of making anything up. They were willing to die for this truth. And the claim was incredible. Jesus was God in the flesh, and he died but rose back from the grave. And that makes all of the difference in your life and in your future and for your sin and my sin and for your eternal life. What happens after you die? That event is the centerpiece that makes the difference for everything else. Right? If Jesus did not rise from the dead, right, then he was just another one. He was a nobody. He was a failed teacher. He was a, a lo- in a long line of hucksters and lunatics who tried to amass a religious following. But Jesus had a group of disciples who said, I saw his scars, I saw his death, and I saw him live and walk and move <laughs> afterwards too. Right? That, that is what we're talking about today. That is this centerpiece of faith. And the scriptures say this is something that is worth giving your life to if that thing is true. But what we're talking about isn't only something to be believed. Right? You can believe something that happened a long time ago. And that's something we have to do as Christians. And believing in Jesus' death and believing in his resurrection. But the story in the scriptures is actually more than that. This actually, this truth, the truth of the glorious gospel, this good news, is not only something to be believed, it's actually something to be lived. It's something, the glory of that moment 2,000 years ago has a way of finding you and impacting your life and transforming you today. Right? It's not only a truth to be believed of something that happened some time ago, but it finds you. Galatians 2.20, the Apostle Paul, one of these early followers of Jesus, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. I have been. <laughs> His death is my death. Right? This is a present tense sort of reality of living with Jesus. Colossians 3.1, you have been raised with Christ. His resurrection lives in and impacts the lives of those who have faith in them. These aren't only past truths to be believed. These are present, powerful realities to be lived out in your life. This is the centerpiece of what we're talking about today. Glory, this glory, this gospel glory that we celebrate around the Easter season is a contagious thing. It gets into you. It changes you, and it transforms you in life and in death as well. We'll read here, um, out of Exodus 34, actually, kind of continuing on with some of the series we've had leading up to Easter Sunday here. This is Exodus 34, verse 29. We're going to catch up with our friend Moses here. It says this. As Moses descended from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands. As he descended the mountain, he did not realize that the skin of his face shone as a result of his speaking with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face shone. They were afraid to come near him. But Moses called out to them, so Aaron and all the leaders of the community returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he commanded them to do everything the Lord had told him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with him, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. After he came out, he would tell the Israelites what he had been commanded, and the Israelites would see that Moses' face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went to speak with the Lord. 
right? So this is a follow-up from some of the things we've been talking about for a few weeks, but Moses has this incredible connection with God. He, he lives in this relationship with God as if they were friends. God reveals his glory to Moses. Exodus 34, 6. The Lord, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth. But what we're reading today is there's this significant way that after Moses would have this time with God, and after he saw God's glory, he was changed. There was something that changed in him. After spending this time in God's glory, the passage says his, his face was notably shining. Like the glory that he had witnessed and received in his relationship with God was actually shining off of his face. And apparently this is more than what we would call a healthy glow. His, his face was so bright, the people around him were afraid. So he, he wore a veil over his face to cover the shining glory that came off of him. And apparently this happened up until the point of his death. He had, there was something in his encounter with God that transformed him, but the glory of God shining off of him in that moment was, was, was terrifying to people, encountering that or witnessing that. So he wears a veil to cover it, right? This is how God's glory works. <laughs> like it finds you. And when it finds you and God reveals himself to you and you receive him by faith, by his glory, he changes you, right? And for most of us, that doesn't mean that our faces start to shine, though that would be kind of neat. <laughs> but what it means is that you begin to change. There is a glory that dwells in your heart that begins to transform you into something else. Moses had to wear the veil, though. He had to wear this veil. There's this barrier between God's glory, even if as it's at work in Moses and all the people. There's a barrier that exists between the shining of God's glory and all of the people so that they couldn't see it. And later on in the New Testament, again, Paul, one of these earlier followers of Jesus, bring up the story again. This is um, 2 Corinthians 3, 12 to 18. 2 Corinthians 3, starting verse 12. He says this. Since then, we have such a hope, we act with great boldness. We are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from gazing steadily until the end of the glory of what was being set aside. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains. It is not lifted, because it is set aside only in Christ. Yet still today, whenever Moses is read, a veil lives over their hearts. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We all with unveiled faces, are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Oh, there's lots going on there. <laughs> the passage says, the, this author, the Apostle Paul, he looks back at the story of Moses and he says, yep, that was incredible. Yes, that was real. But, but Moses' face had to be veiled. Moses bore this veil. He encountered the glory of God, but he had to wear a veil. But the biggest truth he's unpacking here is really this, that through Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection, we don't need the veil anymore. Right? The barrier has been removed. This barrier right, that prevented the people from being even able to look onto God's glory in the face of Moses, that that has been removed. That that is what Jesus has done for us. The glory in the Old Testament, the glory that Moses encountered was real, but the veil has been removed. Verse 15, yet still today, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. So he's saying, the problem though, in receiving the gospel and receiving the good news, is for many of us, we have a veil. <laughs> There's something coming in between you and the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a veil. 
There's a way we're shut down to it. And in here, these are even people reading this story in Exodus who count, can't encounter the glory for all that it is. It's one of the greatest sort of failures, I think, of the church in, in our capacity to spawn really religious things <laughs> that operate as barriers between people and the glory of the gospel. Right? There are religious ways of being. These are people, he's saying, who are reading about Moses, who are encountering his glory, but yet cannot get to the real thing. The religious forms they've inherited have been actually what create a veil for them so they can't see things as they truly are. And I know for there's many of us who probably have some sort of a history that of being in a religious environment, being in a Christian environment, that actually kind of wound up keeping you from the truth. Right? That's very common for people. He's saying this is true. There are real religious barriers that can be set up. But even more than that, there is an enemy who does not want us to see this glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection for what it is. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, it says, The God of this age, i.e. Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Right? Saying there is actually, there are spiritual realities at work in this. That there is an enemy that desires to keep us blind. Right? To blind our eyes. Right? There are these religious sort of veils, but there's an enemy that desires to blind our eyes to the truth. Of what is actually true. To see Jesus for who he is. Right? We like to think, I think, <laughs> that we're all very independent thinkers. Right? We like to think we're in control. But what if, what if there are actually forces at work in our world that are unseen, is what the passage is saying, that are manipulating you to keep you blind? <laughs> right? That's what we're being told here. There are forces at work in our world that want you blind, that don't want you to see the glory of the gospel for what it is. They want to keep you blind. What if, what if there's a veil over your heart? What if you're not as independent of a thinker as you think you are? What if there are other factors at work, right? And there are, don't get me wrong, there are good reasons to believe that this stuff is true, right? Christianity is an intellectual faith. There are good reasons to believe that there is a God, and there are good reasons to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Sometimes for myself, when I'm having moments of doubt, this is actually what I do, literally, I, I, I'm having this moment of doubt, I'm kind of working through this or struggling through this, and then I think to myself, okay, well, what are the alternatives? And you know what really gets me is all of the alternatives are terrible, <laughs> Right? That's what gets me every time, is when I actually think through these sorts of things, all of the alternatives are actually terrible to belief in Jesus. Right? For most of us, there's nothing really compelling about Buddhism and all sorts of other things. Right? There's nothing really compelling about this. And is the best explanation for life as we live it actually that we live in a godless, pointless, random, make-up-my-own-truth sort of universe, as most secular folks in Canada believe? And so when I'm sitting with my doubts, I can sit with that and I can say that, you know, I am convinced that there's more to this world than what that way of thinking has for me. I'm convinced of that. Right? There must be something more true. And Jesus himself is incredibly compelling. And that's what this passage is talking about when it talks about his glory. That if you've ever actually spent time looking into him, if you've spent time with one of the Gospels, Jesus is compelling, right? I remember I grew up in the church. I never read my Bible. I left the church when I was a teenager, and then I started reading my Bible for some reason. That was kind of how my story went. But one of the things I encountered when I actually started reading the Bible for myself is that Jesus felt real. He was surprising. He wasn't kind of vague Christian nice like I was expecting him to be, right? That's not what you find. He's, he has an intensity to him. He's surprising. He's loving. He's merciful. He's gracious. But you never get the impression like he's a pushover. He's witty. He's kind of funny. 
And there was something probably in my rebel heart in that moment that loved the way that he just stuck it to people. He was just so able when all of the authorities would come around, right, even though he was some wandering carpenter that people were following, no matter who came to him, he didn't treat you differently out of how your supposed social importance or what you had, and he invited these these poor and sick and needy people to him, and, and while at the same time giving it to these Pharisees and other folks for keeping them away from him. He was such this beautiful combination of all of these things. He was totally different from what I was expecting. And he bears himself with this sort of authority and this dignity from beginning to end and even to the point of dying on a cross. He still does. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 to 17 says, But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So it's saying we, we have these veils, people have this sort of blindness, but it's actually possible through Jesus for that blindness and for those veils to be removed. For me and for you, meaning you, this is a bit of a point too, but you don't come to Jesus because you see. You don't come to Jesus because you've already figured everything out, because you've already answered every question, Nothing in life really works that way when you get down to it. You don't come to Jesus because you've figured everything out. You don't come to Jesus because you see. You begin to see because you come to Jesus. That's how faith works, right? You, you respond in faith. There are chasms of doubt. There are things coming at you, but you trust in the person of Jesus Christ. You say his ways are better. You come to him in faith in a humble sort of way, even though you don't have all the answers. And when you respond to him, and the reason that Christianity has been around for as long as it is, is because Jesus is faithful to move in the hearts of people who don't deserve it. When you come to him, and you experience his glory, and it's a real thing, and your face might not shine, but for so many of us, we could go around this place and share stories of the intense sort of moments of your life where you know Jesus' glory. Through his gospel, you encounter something that is true. And he brings light to your mind and freedom to your heart and purpose, like a real, honest-to-goodness purpose to your life. There's an author, um, C.S. Lewis. This is one of my favorite quotes. He wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. He says, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. (laughs) So he's saying, I I believe in Christianity because when I look to it, there's something about it that appears true. And I see Jesus, but there's also a way it illuminates everything else in my life, right? That's why, like, people come to faith often because they don't really have any other options. <laughs> the Lord keeps on taking them away, right? But the passage says, through Jesus, the veil is removed. He touches your heart. And though you doubt, you fight, you rebel, you wrestle with yourself, with your faith, but they get to a point where you really can't imagine what the world would look like without him, <laughs> how you would go about living your life, how you would face your death, How would you would raise your family? (laughs) What does that actually look like? And what are you giving them for? And how do you do these things without Jesus? Right? Because he shines on everything else as well. Right? Romans 8 11 says this. The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. (laughs) Right? That's what it's saying. That you, as believers, when you commit yourself in faith to Jesus, have this immediate connection to the the things we're celebrating today, to Jesus' death and his resurrection, that the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that was at work in Jesus' life and raised him from the dead, is the Spirit that is placed in your heart, right? This is where I'm getting at. This is what this has to do with the Easter, in case you're wondering. (laughs) That the glory of Jesus Christ through the Spirit is placed in your heart to be lived every day. It's more than just something in the past that you should probably believe. It's something the passage says, the Spirit of God is placed in your heart to affect the way that you live your life. That glory is placed in your heart, 
right? Your life is filled with the resurrection of Jesus. Or as the passage says I referenced earlier, you have been raised with Christ. That's what this means, right? The spirit of resurrection is living in your chest, closer than a friend, knows you better than you know yourself. And this leads to a freedom in your life. No blindness, no veil. It leads to a freedom in your life and no being weighed down by by shame and by sin and by all of these things, by carrying the guilt of your life with you, of wondering about death and of fearing death, that the spirit of the resurrection lives in you. Verse 12, since then, we have such a hope, we act with great boldness, (laughs) right? There's boldness, there's freedom, there's, there's a purpose and a reason for living that you are given in life. I mean, for so many people um, uh, around Canada, and we look at so many issues and, and personal sort of problems we wrestle with, and it doesn't mean that Christians don't have problems, but how many of the things we struggle with and wrestle with are because we don't know who we are and we don't know the purpose for which we live? Right? And there comes to be a place, it's either you're going to make that up as you go because you don't have an authority to cling to, or you're going to believe you are worth nothing and have no purpose. Right? And there are so many people right, in our world, maybe here, but all around us, who wind up at those truths. I am worth nothing and I have no purpose. And the glory of the gospel, that is the blindness of the God of this world. Right? And the glory of the gospel is trying to give you an entirely different story for the way your life works. And what is true? This is who you are. This is your purpose. And this is the way you were meant to live. And this is how I am going to be faithful for you even after your death. For all eternity. The glory of the gospel in your life. And there is no legitimate answer to that in our world. There's no suitable substitution as much as we try to find one. There's not one. You can't substitute for that. This is, this is the glory that people discover. <laughs> this is the glory they need. This is the glory we cling to. We cling to the glory of the Spirit is placed in your heart. You get a life worth living. Martin Luther King Jr. said once, if you've got nothing worth dying for, you've got nothing worth living for. <laughs> right? And it's true. And, and the truth of this season and of Easter is that Jesus is worth dying for. So you have something worth living for too. Right? This is living in the glory of the resurrection. Right? Second Corinthians 3.18. We all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the spirit. Right? Meaning you can expect in coming to the Lord by faith, he will be at work in your life piece by piece, putting together the pieces. And sometimes it seems slow and sometimes we fail and sometimes it doesn't work out. But there is a building and a growing glory in your life as you look, he says, more intently and you learn to open your eyes by faith more intently to the glory of Jesus at work in you. This is our expectation. The resurrection is something to be believed, but it's something to be lived as well. The spirit at work in your life today. Right? This is what we're looking at. Jesus' resurrection is contagious in this way. Right? It finds you where you are. It doesn't stay put 2,000 years ago, but it will find you where you are today. And it gives you glory in the way you live and in your life today. And we'll close with this, but it even gives you glory in your death. Right? And that is what you need. And that is what most of us do not really have an answer for. Without Jesus, what is death? What do you do with it? What does it look like? What is your expectation of it? Right? And it's this sort of thing that dogs us in this incredible way, but how do we actually answer it? Romans 8, 11, the full passage. The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you, and just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living in you. In other words, it says, this spirit, right, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead and now lives in you guarantees that you will receive life after death because of his presence with you. Your mortal body, right, will be given life. 
This is it. This is the Spirit is the guarantee. The Spirit is this down payment. In the same way Jesus was brought back to life, you will be too. In the same way Jesus had life after death, you will too. By faith in Jesus, you can have these things. But one day, God will breathe his life back into your body again. Right? You, you don't need to wonder about the afterlife. You don't need to suffer for your sins. You don't need to pay the requirement for your sin. Jesus offers you life, and when you live in his life, you live in his life forever. 1 Corinthians 15 puts it like this. This is 15 verse 42. It says, So it is with the resurrection of the dead, sown in corruption, raised in incorruption, Sown in dishonor, raised in glory, sown in weakness, raised in power, sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. Because if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. The passage is highlighting something here. That when it comes to death, a Christian death really doesn't look any different. And that's what makes this so difficult. It doesn't seem different. It says we're sown in corruption. All of us are given over to decay throughout our lives, right? There's all of these sorts of ways we age, we decay, and and our life kind of comes to its end. Death has its grips on us all of the time in this way. 2 Corinthians 14, 16 says, This is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. Right? So even, even as the spirit is at work in you, our bodies are dying. We're on this progression to death, and death looks like decay, And the passage says it looks like weakness, it looks like dishonor, it feels dishonorable, it makes us look like something like this. But the passage says if the Spirit of God lives in you, a Christian death could not be more different. Even though it seems the same, even though it looks the same. Because of Jesus and his death and resurrection, what looks like decay ends in eternal life. And what looks like weakness ends in resurrection power. And what looks like dishonor ends in unending glory. Right? That one day we are all sown into the ground. And when Jesus returns, right, he will come for you. He will bring you back to life, the fullness of life, to glory, to eternal life with him. And we share in his resurrection glory. We look on his face and are transformed day after day. And there is a glory that will meet you. Just like it met him at the most unglorious point of his life. But there is a glory to the crucifixion. And there is a glory to this eternal life. And the spirit of God is at work in us now to guarantee these things into the future. So we look to him. Because there is no other way. There's nothing else that can give this to you. There's nothing else that can really provide this for you in your life. There are no other true and real assurances after death. There's no other power you can really live by in this life. And if this is true, right, if this is true, it changes everything, right? And and for many of us, we are here. The scriptures exist. Our church exists as a statement that has been made for the last 2,000 years, that this Jesus Christ is who he says he is, he did what he said he did, and he will come again for us. And that is a truth worth living and dying for. That is what Easter glory is all about. That is why we are here today, and that is why it is worth celebrating for all of us. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we need your help in so many ways. And even like we talked about, Lord, we know that there is um, an enemy that seeks to blind us. There are veils that seek to cover our hearts, that seek to keep us in seclusion to your um, glory uh, and to your goodness and to your gospel. And Lord Jesus, we pray today that you would break through these things, that you would draw us out of these things, that you would show us the glory of this faith. And maybe, Lord, for some of us, this is the first time of us encountering you, of, of peering past the sort of religious veils and actually seeing you for who you are. But even, Lord, for those of us who believe these things, that you would give us a renewed sense of, of the glory of your death and of your resurrection and of your living, moving spirit at work in our lives today. Father, would you be at work? Would you move in us in this way? Lord, we are so thankful 
for you and for what you have done for us. In Jesus' name.